Well, good morning, everyone. Have you, have you already had church today? I mean, if you, if you didn't even have to listen to Jordan and I, I think most of us could go home today and say, we have been blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much for being the choir that, that learned some songs today, for being the choir that, that sang songs that you may have known or didn't know, and, and still were praising God. Thank you for being the, the audience that heard that wonderful story for our kids but I told Kathy, that's definitely one of my favorites because of what it says. That no matter how long you think you have been separated from God, kind of got separated, but you've got to know that He is the hound of heaven. And there is, as the song that we just heard said, there is no door that He will not kick down. There is no mountain he will not climb to come and look for you. So if you remember nothing else from today, remember those words that Rachel just sang. Because that is a great starting place for where Jordan and I <laughs> get to talk to you about. Because if you, you turn in your Bibles, uh, Matthew chapter 13, you can get this out because it is helpful sometimes to see that uh, maybe, maybe the preacher men have not necessarily followed the exact outline that is in the Bible of the order, you could say, of the, the different parables that Jesus tells. But he tells these parables in a way to help us understand the kingdom of God. And that's what Jordan and I are doing this month. So if you liked what you heard last week because... It, it, it was mostly Jordan, that's good, because it's going to be mostly Jordan again today. If you like that, it's going to be mostly Jordan next week and the week after. Amen. So uh, just understand that we got together, uh, have been for several weeks now, and we're saying, how can we, in a conversational manner, uh, reveal what God is talking to us about in these, in these parables? So this week... We have a trilogy of parables. That is correct. One, one that's probably not going to get as much attention, but that's okay, and that's <laughs> the one with the mustard seed. But let's just all review. What happened to the mustard seed? There you go. It grew that's into it. a tree, but what size tree? Biggest, biggest one in the garden. It was the biggest one in the garden. Okay, so surprise! The, the kingdom of heaven is... Maybe very small on this earth, but it is going to be the biggest. Um, that's one thing. What, what else would you say about that? Well, we were talking a little bit about how uh, the emphasis being on the mustard seed being your faith. Yes. And how it can seem like your faith is, is this very tangible and countable thing, but what comes from that faith is exponentially greater than what you started with. Um, in fact, it says that the birds of the air are able to nest in this tree. In other words, it provides. It's this faith that not only is for you and provides more mustard seeds when it blooms and, and gives off its seeds, but it also provides for the birds of the air. Um, so keep coming to church. You'll get your own flock of birds if you stick around long enough. <laughs> It's kind of happening in my hedge next to me right now. There are birds back, and, and, and they, they talk to me a lot, and my cats, my cats like to watch. Uh, we're, doing with, we're doing the mustard seed today. We're doing the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. The words of the day are investment. You business people out there, you listening? Investment and pursuit. I always think about uh, Grand Tour. There you go. And really fast cars. Because if you don't have as fast a car, you are going to be pursuing. You are not going to be in front. So you always want the fast car. But if you don't, then you want the car that can catch up and then pass them. Okay, so those are the two words we want you to think about today as we go into this. But um, let's, let's, um, let's remind ourselves of the story. There was a man. Uh, he's plowing his field. So this is the scene that I want you to put in your mind. Uh, we don't have any pictures because uh, I want you to have your own picture. 
He's plowing his field. It's old days. Jesus is telling the story, so it's not a tractor. If you want to put a tractor in the story, fine. That's fine. But he has a donkey, probably, or a mule, or, a, or maybe he has an ox, if he's lucky. Maybe he's a rich guy and he has an ox. And he is plowing his field, probably with a hand-carved plow that has uh, a tooth on it that is shaped so that it will turn over the soil one row at a time. And he's, he's going along, and he is literally not only holding on to the reins at one, with, one, with one hand, but he is holding the plow down because his weight is what actually gives the depth to the plow. So you must understand that he's, he's quite intimate with this plow. Okay? It's, it's right up against him. He is holding on to it. And he is also goading, goading the animal that is pulling his plow. And, and, and as he's doing this, bam! He hits up against something that literally stops his plow dead, yanks back on the harnesses of whatever animal he's got, and makes the animal stop because the plow isn't making any forward motion. This is the scene that, that we want you to, to see because this is the story that Jesus is telling. And he says, a man was plowing his field and he ran into something that stopped his plow. He got from behind the plow, pulls away the dirt, and there's a box. Okay? He opens the box, and inside the box is more money, jewels, gold, whatever, more riches than he would be able to ever amass in his entire life. His reaction is very interesting and is actually, I think, a big part of what we're talking about today. Right. He covers it back up. And he goes home and proceeds to look like a madman. His wife doesn't understand. I don't know if, she, if, if he told her. His kids don't understand. But he liquidates... Big word, we know what it means, and we're usually attracted to liquidation sales, aren't we? Because we know everything's going for bargain basement. But he liquidates his entire asset collection. House, uh, uh, extra plow, uh, anything he can sell, he sells to raise capital. Goes to the man who he is leasing the field from and says, I'd like to buy your field. I'm done leasing, I need to buy man says, okay, here's the price. The guy says, oh, that's great, because he has the money. He buys the field. And what's in the field? Now, I, I, think, it's, I think it's interesting. He didn't go to the man who owned the field and said, yo, dude, you are so lucky. <laughs> Look what I found in your field. <laughs> He's smart. He buys the field. He buys the treasure but he had to sell everything that he had in order to make the transaction. And that concludes our TED Talk on agricultural investment. Thank you all so much for coming along. <laughs> Jesus was amazing, and, and he probably would have been on TED Talks. He would have been. So he tells the story, and, and, and so here we go. Um, you find the treasure. The question, the first question is what's, what's it worth to you? Well, I think in the, in the narrative sense, I'm not sure I would have gone home and sold everything. I might have just taken the box, which is not like the greatest thing to do. But what's it worth to you? You can see in the story it's worth everything. You, this guy doesn't hold back. It's not a half measure. Jesus doesn't say he kept his savings account filled. He drained everything, knowing that what was in that field was of greater value than everything else he was going to put toward it. So again, business talk here for a moment. He does a comparison, and he finds that what he will gain is way more than what he will lose. I think that's an, that's an interesting piece to grab a hold of here, because the fact is, I believe, every day we are caused to make these kinds of 
evaluative decisions. Um, I know I do. Can you think of... Let's just poll the audience for a moment. Do you think of... There's anything that you have in your life, maybe in this last week, where you have made an evaluation of what you have or what you are as opposed to what you think Jesus would like you to have or Jesus would like you to be. See where that happens? Happens to me, I think, on a daily basis. I don't know about you. Um, Gain or loss? Is this worth it? That's the question. Yeah, and I think we can all agree that if we were to sit down and be just by the numbers about it, it's a very clear gain. You get eternal life, you get a relational experience, you get drawn into a community that's supportive and, and all these beautiful things. But when you start to measure what you have to give in the short term, you start trying to figure out where you have the time for all that. Where's my investment coming from? Because some of us feel like you're already kind of topped out onto what you can give. Um, or at least I've had that feeling. Um, and so you start to kind of do a compromise. You know, what's the most I can give while still keeping myself afloat in my situation? And I don't think that's the way the game is designed to be played. No. Um, so this, this story is really a model saying you got to have that faith and jump in with both feet. And we had talked about this whole thing requiring courage. Yes, and I don't want to beat no, you to a punchline there. No, no, but, that's it. That's the next um, But there's, there's a lot of, of bravery that comes with that kind of uh, just leaving everything else and going in to follow this, this treasure. Um, and the beautiful thing is what we said earlier today and what we said last week is you get a chance to redo that every day. It's not just a one decision and done. At least that's not the way that I run. I agree. Um, While there's life... Right. Yeah. So, you know, even if you, again, to, to kind of echo last week, if you whiff it on Tuesday, you get Wednesday to try it again. So, um, Something we brought up in our discussions about this. Uh, see, uh, I know you'll remember, Jordan. Um, what if I like the way it is? <laughs> how, how, how did that happen? If Jesus is calling me, if he's this treasure I found and I really want to follow him, but I like my house. I'm, I'm, I like my life. Um, how, how, do I, how do I come to that point? I, I think we use the phrase, how many of you know the phrase, the Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm syndrome yeah. no, the Stockholm Syndrome is where you fall in love with your captors. Um, the immediate person that comes to mind is from my generation back in the day, Patty Hearst, okay, she's captured by the army and ends up joining them because of her mind being changed and now she's one of the, one of the people instead of trying to get away. So we went, we went back and forth on this, I'm not sure how much of a resolution we came to, mm-hmm. um, but I don't interpret that is saying that you're supposed to go home right now and sell everything off that you have. I think this is more of a call from God to say, what can you give up? Where can you reallocate your energy? And, you know, in the practical sense, we can look at our church and we've got all these ministries that are going on. And um, whether it's family promise or prison Bibles or just, you know, helping Paul out with keeping this place standing. um, There's a lot of things that we can do as members of this community and as members of the kingdom of heaven that are an investment. And uh, I think that if if it's worth it to you, Mm -hmm. it becomes something that you're constantly kind of thinking about or you're trying to turn your attention back toward that place. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome is, is something that we brought up because it's easy to get comfortable. And it's easy to sort of take inventory of what you got and say, yeah, that's enough. But, you know, these, especially the last two parables that we're talking about, maybe serve as calls to say, you got to get uncomfortable. Um, and you got to live in a space that's a little less, maybe secure in the short term, so that you can have a lot of security in the long term. 
It, it's a little difficult to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That's how I think of it. <laughs> yeah. um, what if I don't need that? What if, what if I don't need that bread? Because I'm providing my own bread. There you go. Rich young ruler. That's right. Yeah. Pete's right. Rich young oh, ruler comes... Right. Sorry. Thank you, John. Uh, Pete, John is right. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus. What does Jesus tell him is the one thing that's keeping him apart from Jesus? Okay, it's stuff, and that's where I'm, I'm with Jordan. I don't think that what Jesus was talking about was his stuff. It's whatever you worship. It was his dependence on his stuff, right? Now, in the Jewish economy, just to refresh your memory, the disciples were very upset about this moment because they thought this, this rich guy was going to be a really great asset to their campaign to make Jesus king of Israel. And in their culture, rich equaled blessed. I think it's our culture too, right? Yeah. Rich equals blessed, poor equals cursed. So they're looking at this guy, come to Jesus, and they're saying, yes, 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 yes. Jesus, make him one of the team. Please, he's going to be an asset. Put him on the board. Put him on the board. He's... And Jesus says, go and sell your possessions. I, I'm going to take that, maybe interpret it. I hope it's radical enough as just sell your possessions. Go and disconnect your dependence on yourself to save yourself. He's wanting to be perfect, right? Wanting to be perfect. This is the rich young ruler. What do I have to do to be perfect and inherit inter eternal life? Okay, so I'm going to say he was suffering from the Stockholm Syndrome. Sure. He was involved in an, in an economy. He's, he's okay with the way things were. Jesus comes along and says, I would like to save you from that. And he says, no thanks. He says, no thanks, I can do it, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. Yeah, I just don't think he had the courage that day. And the thing is, we don't know what he did with After. the days afterward. Mm -hmm. I'm, maybe I'm optimistic, but I'd like to think that he kind of sat with that for a while, because I know I've whiffed some decisions in the moment and then been able to come back and say, maybe I should take a closer look and take another run at it. But, um, but it's interesting that there the, the item is treasure that he's holding on to, and Jesus uses that same motivator in the parables. These are, in, in both the cases, the pearl and the treasure, these things will make you rich. Mm -hmm. And... Um, one thing that, that really stuck out in our lead-up discussions was that we talked about how this is a great parable for people who are just getting into the Christian experience, who have not had a lot of buy-in before, and this is really a direct parallel. It's like, oh, I had nothing before, and then all of a sudden I found God, and it was great. And my initial um, read on it after growing up in the church was kind of a different one because... We've been tilling this field for our whole lives. I have for my whole life. I know I look around, I see a lot of people who've been you know, here since I was you know, this small. And you know, what do you do with that story when, when you've been working in this field? How do you stay excited about the treasure that's there? Because it's not, you know, at least for me, it's not a direct parallel to say that you know, I had nothing before and then I found this great thing and it's, it's you know, changed everything. I've, I've sort of what was the analogy we used? It's like my parents had been working this field and they told me, there sure is a treasure here. And I grew up and said, yeah, there's a treasure over there. Mm -hmm. But it took a little more than that to get me to go dig it up for myself and to find out what it was worth to me. Um, so I, I almost feel like, from my experience, the parable would look a little different. Um, okay. Just in that it's easy to get blasé. It's easy to get comfortable if you're earning a dollar a day for working that field, that's a dollar you can count on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's something that we have to commit to over and over and over again, which is that, you know, repeated investment into what's in front of you. Right. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm just dreaming here for a moment. Maybe you are too. I, I, don't, I don't know that that guy went back to that field. He owned it now. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe he was now the employer or the, 
person who leased out that field because he took that treasure and he went and bought a whole lot more fields and, and was able to become this person who was not only providing employment for but was you know a, a good landlord. Maybe, maybe before he bought all of those fields, he, he plowed them for a little while, hoping that he'd find check. more treasure. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. We, we don't know that story, but the, the, this distinct impression that I'm getting right now is that, that his life was not the same. No. Okay? So that's where I'm going to kind of say, uh, maybe, a, maybe a, a, you go back in your history. I know I can go back in my family history and there are some forks in the road where some of my family took one way and, and, and other parts of my family went another way. They found the treasure in the field. The treasure was presented to them and they had different reactions to it. And so you and I, we're lifers. Uh, we, we've been brought up like some of the kids that were sitting here this morning. Thank God there's a place like that, right? And, and you know, we, we've been told these stories and we've been introduced to Jesus and we've said yes again and again and again in our lives and we've been experiencing the blessings of having him in our lives. And so I can honestly say my life is different because I was born into that family and that I, you know, that was tilling the field and, and, and that found the treasure and that was sharing, the, sharing that treasure. Okay, I can say that my life was very different than I can, I can say of other people's lives who maybe had the same moment when they came up against that box and dug it up and saw it was inside and were not courageous. This is going to change my life too much. People are going to want something from me now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be looked at as this different person. Um, I don't know if I want... I, I just want to be the man behind the plow, leasing the field. I don't know, that, that feels to me like a referendum on the whole idea of the life that we would be living in this world now if we truly, truly understood and accepted and then acted upon the finding of that treasure. Sure. And it's the kind of thing where you hope that you're able to realize what you got in front of you. Um, you look around and you see the, the church community you have. You see all the opportunities that you have to grow and with good people beside you. And you hope that you have the awareness to come at that regularly and say, how can I engage? How can I really be an active part of this? Mm -hmm. Some days that takes more than it might feel like you have. And, you know, you hope on those days, I hope on those days, that I can count on God to make up the difference. But it's a very human thing to be, uh, you know, within the story to maybe see that box and just say, I'm not messing with that. I, I, mm -hmm. It may have a lot of potential, but there's also a lot of... It, it's going to radically shift everything else that's come before and comfort is a is an expensive thing to give away it is um so i i think there's a lot of different reactions that you could have to to finding <laughs> to finding money in a field namely is the mob going to come and get me if i dig this up and run with it but <laughs> you know there's this is the ideal situation in the parable man finds it immediately recognizes the value goes and does whatever it takes to get it back and <laughs> Similar to, yeah, it's it's the let's focus on that for a moment. It's yeah. the whatever it takes attitude that I think um, I I know that I need to be reminded of that. Absolutely, it, uh, that it, it's basically it's basically an all or nothing situation, and he is willing to give all of it. Uh, shifting just quickly to to the pearl mm -hmm. because these are similar things. There's a there's a pearl merchant and. Um, I read, I read that, that little lady, uh, Ellen, about this, and she makes mention of the fact that the pearl merchant has a, has a two-part meaning to it. And uh, I, I didn't tell you. You didn't tell me this. this. Okay. Uh, it's it's kind of cool, though. And, sure. and I mentioned the, the phrase hound of heaven because that is the idea behind the merchant. It's Jesus. Okay. Just to, just, to, just to pump you up a little bit, okay? Uh, Jesus is the pearl merchant. That's number one reason, uh, number one uh, idea of, that is being put here. He is willing, he is willing 
once he finds the pearl of great price, a.k.a. you and me, he is willing to give all. And Ellen reminds us that heaven gave everything in Jesus to buy us back. So, I, I, you know, how do you respond? How, how do you respond to that except the other side of this idea is the second merchant comes with this idea of when he finds that pearl of great price. Did you, did you catch it in the scripture reading that Sarah read this morning real quick? That's why I put in Revelation. What are the gates of the new Jerusalem made of? Single. This is not many. It's one pearl each gate. But can you imagine the oyster? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fabulous. Sorry. Fabulous. He, he is that. He thinks we are that. So in John 14, he says, I've gone to prepare a place for you so that you can be where I'm at. We can have all the jewels in the heavenly kingdom. When he makes up his jewels, don't we sing that as, when he cometh, when he cometh to make up. Remember that old one? Okay. That's what she's talking about. She even references that song when she says, he will take, he will take this precious one and he will put it in his diadem. This is what he thinks of you and me. So this week when you are tempted, now I've gone to preaching, I know. When you are tempted to think less of yourself because of something that happens to you coming up in this week, I want you to remember you are the pearl of great price in the eye of Jesus. And he was willing to do anything that it took. He was not going to back away. You've heard me say this, I'm going to say it again. That was what the devil tempted Jesus with doing. They're not worth it. Leave them behind. Come down off that cross. Remember you heard the people beside the cross? He saved others. Why doesn't he save himself? Those are the words of the devil. Tempting Jesus to leave us behind. She died this last week. Del Delker. Yeah? Her funeral is in March 24th at Loma Linda. And her voice is what comes to my mind right now. He could have called 10,000 angels. Why? To save him from having to go through what he had chosen to go through. And that's what he was being tempted to do. He was being tempted to leave us, be leave us behind. But instead, he has shown the universe we are worth it. We are the pearl of great price for Jesus. So, in response... What do we do? We search and search and search until we find him. He is our pearl. He is our pearl of great price. But she was pretty pointed. Ellen was pretty pointed in this. And I'm sorry to bring her up again, but I'm going to bring her up again. She says this. If we don't make the effort, we're not going to find it. And okay. I, I think the, uh, the best little closing nugget actually came in the special music. Because um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm moved to say that you read these stories and you should be motivated to chase with a love that looks reckless to Pers everyone else. Pursuit. It should look. Right. It should look dogged. It should look, you know, borderline desperate. It's, it is a reckless thing if you're not really in tune with what, what the value of it is. So I think that's a better little encapsulation than anything you and I might come up with. So be, I, I agree. Be reckless in in the pursuit. Going to close with the last story, okay? Uh, she was demon possessed seven times. She was also a well known harlot, and Jesus saved her. In response, 
because she had found her pearl, because she had found her treasure, she came to Jesus at a supper that he was invited to by Simon, who we are told by Ellen had been the one to lure her into prostitution, if you can imagine. Jesus is at his house. He had gotten leprosy and Jesus had healed him. And so in response, he invites him to supper. Oh my goodness. Really? That's it? You were dying a terrible death and all you can do is invite the man to supper? At that supper, they're lying down, they're uh, reclining at table, so all of their feet are fanned out around the table. This is typical Middle, Middle Eastern style. And so it's not un, unthinkable that somebody could sneak into that dark candlelit room unnoticed until she takes out a very special stone box that is sealed with wax and has in it the most expensive perfume that is known to the Middle Eastern world. She cracks open that spikenard and then pours it on the feet of the pearl of great price. Do you see the correlation there? It's amazing. For me, it's just illuminated the story to add it in to the situation where she had found the treasure. She takes it out of the box and she pours it. And when they say, oh, that was a waste of money, Jesus wards them off and says, no, her story will be told every time we tell the gospel story. Because her story is the way that Jesus is hoping we will respond to the gospel. That we will be willing to pour out our essence on him every last. It cost her a year's wages, they estimated, to have poured all of that out on him. So there's a, there's a really great group that I know that all of you guys who, who do music know. They call themselves... Jars of clay. It's not the jar, people. It's what's inside. When that farmer, his plow kicked into that box, it's not the box. It was what was inside the box that got his attention. We, my friends, we, my friends, are part of the kingdom of God. What God would like to do to us is what he did to those jars at the wedding feast. He would like to fill us with the new wine of the kingdom, the spirit of God, and then pour us out on the world. Amen. And guess what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's as bad as buying an expensive bottle of wine and putting it in a cellar to get dusty. Some people think that's a good thing. I say, uh-uh. I think that what Jesus wanted was to fill us up so that we could be poured out. Because it's not the jar. It's what's inside that the world needs, that they need to know. So I, I told Chris I would do this, and, and she said, okay, all right. Y'all ready? You came to church today, and I'm going to give you a sensory experience. Okay? You're going to go, ooh, ooh, that makes my nose tingle. Ooh. Some people might be allergic, Mike. Okay, Come on. I, I know, just, just, just a little bit more. Febreze, right? Okay? So now, now, when you ever think of this story again, you're going to say, you know what? What Mary did that day, the, the pungent odor that happened that day, that that people who really didn't get what she was doing thought was such a waste was actually exactly what God desires. In fact, he put an altar in front of the partition between the holy and the most holy. And what was going up? Into incense. And what are we told? What are we told that incense is? It's our lives. It's, 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 our, it's our prayers to God. 
So this week, this week, with what you do and what you say, uh, please, may the incense of your life fill your world so that those around might go, ooh, ooh, what's that? Ooh. And realize it's expensive and it costs you a lot. And you were willing to waste it all on Jesus. Amen. Amen.